firstly, thank you very much for coming and congratulations for coming because I've asked about five people who haven't replied and the ones who actually asked face to face, the look on their face was if I was the, the Pope being asked to take down his balcony. They were so shocked um, and appalled to be considered to be in this wonderful edge group that I don't know if I'm going to talk to them again. So thank you very much for, for, for coming. I think it's going to be a great day. It's the brainchild of my of our partner, business partner, David Wellesley Wesley. He came up with it many years ago, and it's wonderful to see that it reach fruition. We're, but most fortunate to have, in our first talk, uh, John Standing, whose name goes before him, really needs no introduction. He's, he's for 50 years, he's 60, 70 years, he's been a mainstay of, of our, <laughs> our, our, what will be a wonderful cultural legacy, I think. The, 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 the great strength of your generation is like any older generation, you're, you connect with the generation before. And I'm, I'm afraid we will be asking you to talk about some of the greats of, of that time. We're truly honored to have you with, with, with us. Um, I started watching some of John's films, and uh, Rogue Mail was the one I watched yesterday, and it's on, on YouTube, absolutely brilliant. So, so, um, we have uh, Lawrence Gallacy, another remarkable man. I didn't realize, I'm afraid, in, until I started looking at these speakers, that n none of the three of them have retired. So we haven't really got anything to tell you. Uh, <laughs> but what we will do is hopefully have some interesting stories. Um, Lawrence, as he will explain, is, is doing some of the most important work possibly in, in uh, medicine at the moment. And it's, it, I'm, I'm going to let him explain, but it's, it is truly remarkable how he has come to this stage at a certain stage of life, given his um, background, which was in, in, in hotels. He's one of the great hoteliers of the age. And it's a very interesting link between um, hospitality and uh, hotels and uh, senior age, late, late age care. Um, Gina Sturdy Morton uh, as well, and uh, he'll introduce himself more about what he does. Uh, but, uh, quite phenomenal at a certain time of life to develop an enterprise which seems so straightforward as a sort of virtual club for old people where you host the uh, events which is so necessary for many of them, and you'll, you'll explain why. But at Bubble, it's fun, and it's celebrating this time of life where you, if you have a little bit of health and a little bit of wealth, and you don't have two demanding grandchildren, what, what a great time to be. And so today, we're, we're just going to have some fun, I think, and um, I hope you'll enjoy it. So, John, John, John um, you, you came to the Hurling Club the first time many years ago. I did. Uh, why, why was it? What, what, what led you here? Oh, I was a soldier at the time, and I was stationed at Winchester. I was a green jacket. And um, I fell into an amazingly pretty girl uh, when I was at Winchester. And, and uh, she said, I'm going to have a dance in London. And I said, oh, really? And I, and I didn't know her at all. And she said, would you like to come? And I said, yes. She said, anyway, I'll send you an invitation. She duly sent me an invitation. And I thought this was a private house. I had no idea it was some sort of, I don't know what, a sports club. Um, so I arrived, I arrived at the dance, and she was utterly adorable. Um, and she subsequently became a, a marchioness. So she did frightfully well, and she pulled something. <laughs> and I thought I was going to pull her, because, uh, and, and, and failed hideously. And I was just a kind of, you know, penniless soldier, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I came here um, not knowing what it was. And I've subsequently been here several times to watch my son play cricket here. But um, otherwise, I, because I'm not, I, I was moderately sportive when I was a boy, but only to play cricket. I was like, I didn't, and I couldn't play tennis or anything like that because I was always a rather sissy game, which of course it isn't at all. It's rather spectacular tennis. And, and your, your uncle was a great cricket commentator, wasn't he? What? Your, your uncle was a. Uh, my uncle was a uh, cricket commentator before the war. He would, he, with Jono, he. Um, was one of the early test commentators, and his name was Michael Standing. He was a lovely man, and he was in the ARP. I know that during the war. And I remember the war terribly, terribly well, because we were shoveled into a basement. My mother, who was an actress, and my grandfather, who was another actor, uh, and my 
great two great uncles. One was called Percy and one was called Wyndham. And they were both actors as well. They were disasters. And they were in, they were in um, Los Angeles um, playing tiny parts in films for people like Hitchcock. One was allowed to say yes quite often, and that was about the strength of it. And occasionally, when things got really fizzed up for him, he could say no as well. But but um, my great my other my grandfather was in films like Lives of a Bengal Lancer, uh, and finally he was bitten by a black widow spider that killed him, um, and. Uh, he was an adorable man. Niven was a, a, a friend of mine and said that my, my grandpa had been incredibly kind to him when he was a young actor to start with um, because he, he'd also been a soldier. And uh, he just, you know, came from the army and popped into a, whatever it was in Los Angeles where he became, you know, immensely successful and well, adorable and, and incredibly funny and wondrously irreverent. Um, as, I, as, I, as I suspect my grandfather was as well. And when actors are, we don't give a m monkeys about anything very much. Do you know what I mean? It's all kind of... Because we are... Um, <laughs> we are. We have to do what we're told, no matter what, you, what whatever happens. I mean, you're given a part and play it. Um, and, and that's the kind of end of it. But you have to do what the director tells you when, and... Uh, and I did a play with Maggie Smith. We did Private Lives for, I think, 18 months, unrelentingly, both here and in America and on Broadway. And, on. Listen, and I'm not going to take and, up ever. And before that, you you had a, your your first part, big part, really, was with with Lawrence Olivier and Vivian Lee, wasn't it? It was walking on. Yeah, I was yeah. a spear carrier, and it was. I, and the job started. It was for Stratford, and I went Paris. Uh, Paris, Venice, Vienna, Belgrade, Zagreb, Warsaw, London, my first gig. And my first night in my first job, there was an enormous rat in the uh, passage outside my dressing room. And I was a Roman, you know, a, a spear carrier. And I took out my sword and I chased this bloody thing all the way down the passage. And I thought, this is the beginning of, you know, the madness of my job, really. Um, <laughs> And you're, but, and you're still working. You're, oh, Lord, I've just finished yeah, a film yeah. with Michael Caine, who, yeah. poor old darling, has had a terrible trouble walking, but, but uh, he was brilliant in it. And, and, um, the Great Escaper. It's called The Great Escaper. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Cool. I've just got to read you a little <laughs> bit. I've got to read you something that, that uh, Henry Wordsworth, long, that long, Longfellow wrote. Let us cherish and love old age, for it's full of pleasure if one knows how to use it. Fruits are most welcome when almost over, all of which is utter bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> Old age is a real fucker, let me tell you. There's nothing good about it at all. It's utterly dry. I fall over from time to time for no good reason whatsoever. I just crumble. Um, it's, it's hellish. I'm about to be um, 89 later this year, and it, it's... It's not much fun, any of it. I don't think anybody to tell you it's lovely is talking through them. So sure, you're, you're about to be n 90, I think. What? Did you say 80? I thought it was 90. I'm going to be 90. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be 90 next yeah. year. Yeah. Um, and do, do you think, but, but, but all three of you have this extraordinary uh, gift, if you like, in common of, of not wanting to retire. Um, I haven't quite asked you that, but I, I just made an assumption that if you retired... You'd, your, your family would probably become an item on the news. I mean, how, 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 would, how would you deal with that, given how incredibly busy you all are? You, you don't agree with retirement? No. No. Christ, no. It would be so boring. I mean, you know, you have to keep going at some level, even if you fall over. <laughs> it's, worth, it's worth a shot, let me tell you. I really mean it. I really mean it, too. So just keep, keep trucking. Keep doing something. And above all, taking some form of exercise. I've got a dog that pulls me over from time to time and we go walking. out. It's a Labrador, so it's, you know, it's big and friendly and kisses everybody in the street. Uh, and it just loathes other dogs. But but that aside, it's, it, it's, it's wonderful to, to, to use a dog or, or whatever. And it would just to keep, you know, reading, watching television, watching a bit of porn, anything you like. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> 
anything that cheers you up, really. So, but, but yeah. look, look, looking forward is also so important, but you've got so much to look back on. I mean, you had some wonderful times with Peter O'Toole, and I'm sorry we, we have to ask you about them because they're, they're so amazing, the stories. And there was one involving a teapot at a funeral I was hearing about. Yeah, it's too awful. But anyway, um, I, I, I told this story at Peter's Wake, which was at the Old Vic, and um, he was a, a really rated actor and, and a proper, proper old-fashioned lardy, a proper star, uh, and an absolute darling. And he came to see me in a play once at the RSC, and he came round to my dressing room afterward and said, Johnny, you're a very funny man, and promptly cast me as a perfect pig in a thing called Rogue Male. Uh, in which I was playing the heavy. Would I come and join him doing this? We better rehearse it. We better work on it in Ireland. And he had a he had a little house in in Southern Ireland in Connemara. And I said, of course I will. Of course I will. Um, and uh, we we he said, meet me. I we will be flying Aer Lingus. There's a potted plant. There's a potted plant on the way to Aer Lingus, Johnny. I shall be sitting under it, smoking weed. <laughs> so I said, okay, then I'll be fine. I'll join you there. Um, and so I joined him there. And we went to his house. And, 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 uh, every, and we were, well, the script was waiting for us in plastic covers. And naturally, it was never even taken out of the plastic covers. And we were there for two weeks alone, just talking to one another and laughing and smoking. And one day, um, and we used to go to the pub every night. And, and Peter was off the booze then and not, sm and not drinking at all. And we'd go to the pub and, and we'd have a, a joint or two and then we'd go back to um, his house and play snooker. Uh, and we'd play that till about four in the morning. Then we'd go to sleep and then we'd wake up and have a fish lunch, which meant opening a can of sardines. So we'd eat the sardines and one day Peter said, Johnny! Have you ever fucked a nun? And I said, um, no, I don't think so, no. I don't think I have, no. So he said, then why don't we go and try? I said, well, no reason, really. I come to think of it. So he said, we'll go down to the nunnery. So we went to the nunnery. We were greeted by an absolutely charming little red-faced nun who was adorable. Said, so, oh, Mr. O'Toole, come in, come in. We'll sit. I said, well, we go into this room here. And there's a big pot of tea waiting for you. So there was this huge uh, brown pot of tea. And this is the story that, and this is true, I told this story at, the, at his wake. And, and, uh, he said, and Peter said, well, hang on a minute, I'm just going into the lavatory because we're going to have a, oh, we're just going to have a suck on a bit, bit more weed. So we then, we then had to suck on weed and the smoke was pouring out and the little nuns were in their knees and doing all this sort of, you know, the, 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 uh, talking to, to the, um, to the, what was it, the dictator, the, the celestial dictator. They were having a chat with him. And then we went in for tea and the nun leapt up onto the table and sang a really disgusting version of The Sound of Music. <laughs> So we were completely flabbergasted and you know, the, all the wind was completely taken out of our, our sails. And inevitably, we did nothing. And when, uh, when I told this story at his wake, um, <laughs> uh, from the wings, as it were, at the old Vic, a voice came across, John standing, there was no brown teapot. And she was there. The nun was there, Sister Agnes. Will you come and play golf with me? No, absolutely not. What's your handicap? I don't know, about 26. I said, well, that's useless. I said, because you never get anywhere. We'll, get, we'll spend our entire time wandering around looking for balls. And she is the most adorable woman. Well, you know, I'm an Irish nun, so I'm never troubled by anything like this. She said, I'm never troubled by anything. I've got, you know, Irish nuns are not like normal nuns at all. You are not kidding. I'm... The, <laughs> disgusting version of, of the sound of music she sang with the hills are alive with the sound of fucking and you thought whoa you're a nun for Christ's sakes but uh, she was adorable is adorable and she's uh, still trotting around still and of course she does wonderful things for people because she has an advanced sense of humor 
about the whole game of nunnery and or whatever the you know religious trick is. Yeah, it's, anyway. it's, it's very important to remember. There's no intellectual criteria about getting old, so we're, we're not here to uh, really talk about anything remotely serious. But that 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 is wonderful. I mean, it's just it's so Im- important to hear what what we all wanted to hear, Frank. <laughs> uh, thank you. But L- Lawrence, um, you were the national triple jump champion when you were fifteen. Well, it was better than doing anything else. And you were the first Jewish man to play in in a national rugby team. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It was an experience. If, I, I might be in for the high jump if I ask if it, there's anyone who doesn't know what a triple jump is. Does, does anybody know what a triple jump is? I do. Doesn't know. Um, I might ask one of our team, Harry. You're talking. Can you come and show us what a triple jump is? Just make, make your way down. And, um, Harry Cobb is a w- wonderful sportsman, wonderful uh, colleague, and it's very important to show us how triple jumps work. So, because it's 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 such an achievement, I think, to be. Um, a, a national champion, but like you, 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 you must be a very driven man to, to achieve what you have. As as a one of the great hoteliers of your generation, um, you were in the Israeli army, in uh, just when uh, you had the first female prime minister of, of is, Israel. What what was what was that like? Was it, again, using you as leverages to the past. I mean, it, it's and, and tell us how you ended up in the Israeli army. Um, first of all, I, as you can probably tell, there's not a very thick book of great Jewish triple jumpers <laughs> and even thinner book about great Jewish rugby players. So I was hardly the typical Jewish lad in London, but it was a, sports was an escape from the ghetto, if you will, for me. That was fine, but it was, one would be fairly subject to... Um, a lot of anti-Semitism growing up. Right. I did manage to get in the hotel industry, ran away from home, got back to England. I was an assistant manager at the age of uh, just 19 at the Park Lane Hotel. And there was an incident with uh, Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. He became king. Um, where the, the barber had offered to um, give him a very close ear-to-ear shave, shall I say. <laughs> And uh, they came to me to complain, and I thought it was rather a good idea. Anyway, the Major de Fries, uh called me in after lunch, and he was really sober after lunch, and said, if you feel that way, why don't you bugger off and join those Jews in their army? So in pinstripe and tails, and I suspect I'm the only person ever so done, I volunteered for the Israeli army, not speaking a word of Hebrew, not knowing anybody there. It was an experience. I was going to be Paul Newman in Exodus. Jew amongst Jews. Instead, what did they call me in basic training? Limey. <laughs> so, so you've got Harry, he's a very busy man. Can you just give us a quick demonstration of a, of a triple jump there? Would you rather I do it, Harry? I'm happy. I was going to ask. What? I, I didn't want to ask, but I mean, you know, so... Um, maybe we can. It's known as hop, step and jump. Hop, step, jump. Now the beauty, the beauty of that is I was the Middlesex schoolboy long jump champion for three seasons and every time I got to the nationals I never made it to the finals. Well I found, oh, it was a wonderful thing, I was walking away having been thrown out of the long jump championship, I saw these lanky boys older than me and there were five of them standing by a hip and I'm watching this and I said I've never seen this before. When were the heats? No heats. When were the semis? No semis. I said, why? They said, there's only five of us that have qualified with the distance to be at the Nationals. Aha! So anyway, I found out even less people did it at the age of 15 or under or 16 or under. So I practiced on the paving stones in, in London. And as you know, they are fairly equidistant. They're all the same size. And I went back and uh, showed the school coach he said, do that again. He said, I think you'll qualify and probably win the Middlesex Championships, which I did. So I found that there was only five people that had got the national standard. So I go to the pit, I'm looking at these people, I'm wearing spikes, and I came up to a conclusion. If I couldn't win this, and if I wasn't winning after the first two jumps, I was going to spike the other four. 
and they were dead. Anyway, they were even worse than I was. That was the story. It was literally the kingdom of the blind. You're right, Matt. Can you just critique our, 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 Harry? Just a quick, just quite a quick demo ahead, please. Yeah, hop, skip, and a jump. I what? Not bad. I went further. <laughs> no competitive edge. <laughs> well done, Harry. Thank you, Harry. So, um, Lawrence. Uh, it's it's very interesting what you, you've been doing with West. You're the Chancellor of West London University, and you have set up uh, an MSc program in dementia care, which is completely groundbreaking, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. It was. Uh, look, um, very quickly, I got to be Chancellor of the University not because of skills, talent, or anything else, but I. I um, it used to be called Ealing Technical College. And it morphed and morphed and moved, morphed till it became a university. When it was Ealing Technical College, and I, I'd come back from Switzerland, I took a job at the Connaught Hotel, wanted to get, as a chef, wanted to get promoted, and the only way they could, would promote me if I did part-time chef's course at then Ealing Tech. So they actually thought I was an alumnus of the university. And do you still cook? Oh, yeah. 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 Is that, that's one thing about your generation, is, is how long the men can continue in their marriages denying any ability to cook whatsoever. It, it, oh yes, I cook, but Jenny does everything else. Yes, yeah. She can mend fuses, paint things, do everything else. I can't. <laughs> um, so you, you, you've, you've really worked in all aspects of yeah. hotel management. But the, but the university yeah. that was, yeah. I didn't realize they, they asked me to become chancellor. It was 111 out of 112 and about to be closed. Uh, by the government, so we were the, the new chan vice chancellor. Myself, a sort of last chance saloon, and so we devised a plan. It was this is the university. If any of you, you probably will know one of our campuses. As you're going west towards Heathrow, you've got Glaxo, Smith Klein, GSK on the left. Opposite, there's some office buildings. That's one of our campuses there. So we were broke. I sort of figured out how to make money out of their real estate. We wrote a mission statement that we would become, it had to be different, we'd become an ethnic university and a vocational university. Now we are a very wealthy university and number 28 in the country. So we focused, when I saw this and I'd started dementia, I realized that dementia was as, pr that care, senior care was as primitive, and this is six, seven years ago, it was primitive in this country and in the, and in the United States where I'd spent 40 years primitive as the hotel industry was nearly 50 years back. So the first thing I wanted to do was get education in. So you start at the top. I put a march, built a master's science course, which we still have, first in the country, first in the, anywhere, in dementia care. And now we, we've done vocational courses. And then I built the Geller Institute of Aging and Memory to do research and to start national standards for, for dementia care qualifications. Because if you don't have people, you don't have qualifications, A, how do you build a business, an industry? B, how do you get consistent care? And how do you give people of my generation and a wee bit older the dignity, the respect, and the quality of care they need? Because I fall down too, John. We all do. But I want, I want it to be, I want us to live better, longer, healthier, with dignity, grace, and entertainment. Who's Grace? Uh, my ex-girlfriend. Oh, oh, um, the, the, the link between dementia and uh, your, your sport, which I, so just to, to rewind, that, that comes through concussion, your studies on concussion. That's very important work that you've done. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, I was a rugby player. Fine. I came back to this country and I, I was asked to chair a charity with another, with a really serious rugby player called Jason Leonard, who was then the most capped English rugby player so Jason and, I, Jason and I were chairing a charity, and he wanted me to meet some of the people in the charity, a bunch of ex-British Lion rugby players. They're all, they were then in their 40s, and I was watching them, seeing some indications, and they said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm building dementia care homes. And so they all told me their stories of their forgetfulness, how they've been concussed. So I started to fund some research. Fast forward comes come, uh, comes COVID, and litigation, class action suits. I think in suits. I think group litigation. I think they call it in the UK, by ex-professional some ex-professional rugby players, 
who are out of money and they decide they get trapped by litigation lawyers. They're going to sue the rugby football union, the, the Welsh rugby, world rugby, anybody they can find because they've got dementia. Yeah. There is actually yet to be a causal link between the two, but there's obviously something. And so I was offended by group litigation because I then found out that not it was promoted by lawyers who wanted the fees, and in group litigation, they'd get 30 to 40% of the award. And they, the lawyers in turn, were backed by private equity. So the players were irrelevant by it. So with another famous rugby player, Simon Shaw, we started a charity to protect... I'd seen what happened in the States. The game gets influenced, the rules of the game get influenced by litigation, not by need. So we started this charity. Oliver Dowden, then... Um, deep, DCMS secretary found out about it, asked me to come the, become the ministerial advisor. Two years forward, we put together a situation. I'm very proud that two or three weeks ago we announced the new national guidelines and protocols, and the United Kingdom is now the leading country in the world dealing with concussion in sports, and it is doing some wonderful research. There are two and a half million cases of concussion annually, and I hope we've taken fear away from parents and families and made it simpler to get treatment. So I'm pretty proud of that. Hence Megan. dementia. Yes, yeah. So that, that's a great achievement. Um, the, the, the best dementia test I saw was an, an advertisement for donation saying, if, you, if you've lost your phone, don't worry. If you've lost your phone and find it in the fridge, give us a call. That will hurt us. <laughs> let me... Let me let me tell you, look, I, I lost both my parents from, from yeah. dementia. And uh, I knew my father had dementia, although I choose to ignore it a year. He was an alcoholic. But when I took him out to lunch, as I would meet him once a month in his home in Vegas, I took him out to lunch once. When he didn't know the name of wine, let alone Chardonnay, and he probably single-handed kept the Chardonnay industry alive for decades... Uh, I knew it, I, and I have wish I would have not ignored it or want to ignore it all those years, similar with my mother. So we started this dementia thing, and I, wa I want to share with you just for two minutes why I started it and what I wanted to do. I started it because I was chairing the Alzheimer's Society's national campaign to fundraise. I am a prodigious fundraiser. Could I have all, all of your addresses, emails? I'll be in touch later. Um, but it, it no. is a... We, we started it saying we could do something in London using my hospitality skills where everybody else had failed to build care homes in central London. It was too expensive real estate. So we said we'll be better than our others. That's fine, we are. But we also had an ethos, and I haven't deviated from a second. And let me share it with you because I hope it'll help. One, we said get the people off psychotropic drugs, which all the... GPs and doctors and care homes prescribe. It's like giving morphine to a cancer paper, pa a patient. It's a sedative. Two, they don't eat. Don't eat for a lot of reasons. The food is slop. The carers can't be bothered to fight it or whatever. So we kept, I just, as an ex-chef, I decided that I would do the research at the University of West London. Um, and we did that and we came came up with a diet that was for people really in their latter years, anybody over 70. No real surprises, it's basically a Mediterranean diet, sort of. And we then did, did develop 200 recipes for, to be the equivalent of one Michelin star. Not because I'm egoistic, it's because we wanted to entice people to eat, because if they eat more, they're stronger. If the stronger they can do the mental and the physical simulation exercises, which we believe in, if they can do all of that, they're going to, and we can put people in a social situation and they can have social interfacing, they, they will live longer. So I told this story three weeks, four weeks ago at the Crick Institute, the World Dementia Council Summit, and there are all these researchers there, three or four hundred Nobel Prize aspirants. And I said, so we did intensive research, blah, 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 blah. And I said, and we found out the reason that our people are living four times longer than their estimated term when they come in. And that's simple. They're having a good time, and they don't want to die. And neither do I. So I'm looking after myself.
So you have this wonderful uh, Love Day uh, brand now, isn't it, yes, really? It's, it's a d- dementia brand. It must be one of the first of its kind. And if you uh, can see in the Sunday Times, in, in the, I think it's the ho- home section, isn't it, yesterday, uh, you'll, you'll see all of these beautiful pictures of your, your new home up well, in... The one in Abbey Road. Yeah, yeah in Abbey Road. And it's, it's fascinating how do you use the colours and lights and it's, it's beautifully thought through. And it's, it's it, one of the most positive things I've seen in the Sunday Times... Ever, I think. I'm, I'm going to yeah. say one thing yeah. to this group. You know, our parents created a generation they went through, our families went through World War II, went through whatever they did. They created the society that we and our children enjoy. They created it. We are creating the society for other generations to enjoy. And we deserve the best, we deserve dignity, and we deserve to live long, busy, and fulfilled lives. Never forget it, and know that people like me are dedicated to making sure that happens, and in my case, self-interest is pervasive. But we, you, we are creating a society, and we deserve the dignity and respect and the longevity for having created what we all live in today. And please, please, please never forget it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, very, very privileged to have, have you with us. And, and, and Julian, um, you, you come from a very different career background in uh, finance, looking after small, medium sized companies. And then something happened, which you're going to tell us about, which led you to becoming a, a sort of slightly senior serial entrepreneur and a guest at the coronation. <laughs> Just where we, we couldn't contact you for about two weeks because he was he was still queuing, I think, to get in or out. But, um, uh, but uh, queuing for the loo, I think. Yes. <laughs> it was quite a tough process. Yes. Uh, well, I started out in life trying to become a priest or a vicar, and pretty well everything in life is about sales. And I realised that that was one area where I could try and live the life, but I was not going to be a good salesman. So I went into a career as a banker, and as someone said, that's profits to profits, are you dyslexic? Um, But I went into banking, I had a good career in banking for quite a number of years and worked with some of the largest companies, some of the most interesting companies. Left the city at the beginning of the century and started advising smaller companies. And it was actually in this room about 15 years ago that we launched something which was here called Silver Screen and many of the faces out there will remember it and do remember it because it's still very active and it was all about creating opportunities for people over a certain age to have fun and to do it with the least amount of energy and effort possible and as affordably as possible I'd actually build a community. We are about animating communities. Because human beings are, we are tribal animals, we're community animals, we're animals that require society and the company of others. And as much goes on in the mind and goes on in the way in which we live healthy lives, by being with other people, whether it's in a nunnery or elsewhere, Uh, as in any other context. Life is more interesting if... We say there are four rules, and I I love the rules you have for for dealing with dementia. We have four rules for dealing with the simplicity of old age, or indeed any uh, stage of age. Someone to talk to, something in the diary, a sense of humour, and a responsibility, a reason to get out of bed. I mean, if you've got all four of those, you're doing pretty well. So our view is to try and create an environment in which we have those four things and other people may as well. We have a a friend who probably at the moment is driving an ambulance out to Ukraine. He does that sort of thing. And he says, Julian, very successful businessman in in his time. He's now retired. He's, Julian, there are three stages in life. You learn, you earn, and you return, by which he means you give back. But actually, we're all in the return phase, apart from you, you're still in the earning phase. But all the rest of us are heavily in the return phase, where you can either opt 
learning and earning is mandatory. You don't have a choice. You have to learn, you have to earn, you have to have a living. But when you get to a certain age, and it is the third phase of life, because now we retire with a third of our lives still ahead of us, you get to this stage, and you hope. You, well, am I just going to sit here, or am I actually going to enjoy myself and use everything that I've learned and the bit I've accumulated, or the bit I need to accumulate, and actually have fun doing something different? My wife, Maria, and I both passionate about music and theatre. She's very knowledgeable. I go along for the ride. And so that was the area in which we, we focused. Fifteen years ago, almost, in this room, we showed, uh, next door we showed a film, um, Mrs. Miniver. And we came here for tea afterwards. And it was the start of people talking to each other, meeting new friends, creating, animating a community. Well, it's, it's not rocket science. It's incredibly simple. It's not MSC material. It's not the grand stuff, although it has its moments. Um, and it was in this room that I had to introduce John Julius Norwich after lunch once. I've known him since I was a child. He and my father shared an office in Beirut um, back in the 1950s, so I'd known him since I was yay high. And I had very carefully written out on a piece of paper 45 words that I was going to use as the introduction. And John Julius looked at me and said, Julian, what have you got on there? So I said, well, this is what I'm going to say. He didn't look at it. He took out an identical piece of card on which there were 27 words which were going to supply him with a one-hour talk. And at the head of it, it said, my favorite subject, me. Which was, in effect, the subject I'd given him to talk about. And John Julius talked in a riot of nostalgia. But what was really compelling about him, and what I think is compelling for all of us, is he was not living in the past. He was always looking at the next book he was going to write, the next project, the next place he was going to visit. He wrote, effectively, biographies of countries, and he was always looking to get under the skin of the countries he was going to visit. And so I think, from our perspective, we get to the point of now what? And we think, well, we've got all this time, we've got all these opportunities, there's no point in looking backwards. Chameleons and rabbits and um, parrots, I think, are the three animals that can look behind them. We are not, we look forward, that's what humans do. In, in, in the the in, Aborigines don't have a word for yesterday or tomorrow. Well, that makes perfect yeah, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they've got some very, very good dream time stories there. Yeah, yeah. But we live in the present, we live in the future, and our view is having something to do that we can enjoy. There are great advantages of having a, a job in retirement and, and volunteering. One of the advantages is that you don't have a boss if you create your own business in retirement. It's very, well, I have, I've got Maria, but uh, normally one doesn't have a boss. Your time fluid, and you can give what you have, not what someone else wants to take from you. Volunteering, of course, has another huge advantage, and that is that although you don't get paid, you get to meet people you wouldn't otherwise meet, and it's cheaper than golf or owning a racehorse, which are two great advantages. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wearing the watch I got as a games maker during the Olympics. It's a slightly bright color. And I was a driver, and that was enormous fun. Uh, as a driver, I had at one stage for two days, I had a man called Dr. Alexei Pleskov. He was the chief medical officer of the Sochi Olympics. And driving him around, he explained he was there from the medical perspective. He said, Julian, I am also in London to see about program of games makers. I am here to learn how to do it because in Sochi we will have program of games makers. I said, well, Alexei, that's great, but do you have a, a tradition of volunteering? Yet. So I said, how are you going to attract 60,000 volunteers to act as games makers in Sochi? Julian, please. We have already sent out 60,000 letters saying you are volunteer. <laughs> So, my main passenger for those, um, those three or four weeks was Dame Kelly Holmes, 
wonderful person. And how else, other than volunteering to drive around in a car, was I going to spend three weeks with one of the icons of the sporting world sitting next to me? Not always healthily. She had her adoptive father and two of her school friends in the back of the car at one stage. She was in a wonderful, slinky, green dress. She'd been an ambassador for BP. I was driving her to the English, England women's hockey match. I said, Dame Kelly, you need to be in your tracksuit. You can't be in that dress for this. You're in the wrong outfit. Oh, Christ, Julian. And with that, she said, close your eyes. I've got to change. And sitting next to me as I was steaming through London, breaking the speed limit as fast as I possibly could and pretending that my eyes were shut, Dame Kelly changed out of her slinky dress and into her tracksuit. I almost had a coronary at the moment at which she said, Junior, you can open your eyes now. I've got my knickers back on. But so there are moments when I think actually doing something for nothing is fun. Growing, age, grow, growing old disgracefully. I hope so. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're very fortunate as, as, as an actor, really, that there's, there's no career end to it. You, you don't have to retire when you're 52. Or in United Arab Emirates, you retire when you're 47. <laughs> yeah. In a full pension, you can keep going. Um, I suppose so, yeah. I mean, I've just finished doing a film with Michael Caine, and, and uh, oh, no, I mustn't do this. This is what's so simply frightful. I must remember her name. Um, Jackson. Um, what's Glenda Jackson? What's Glenda Jackson? Glenda Jackson, who is, I have to tell you, simply brilliant in it. And uh, so, well, yeah, but so, so it involved learning an awful lot of lines and doing all the sort of things that we've been doing for a very, very long time. But it was terrific to do. The only thing that was really awful about it was we had to shoot some of it in France and inevitably couldn't because of Brexit. Um, and, it, and it made it incredibly difficult. And it, they, so we had to make France in England. And of course, the architecture is totally different and everything. But because it's movies, it was possible to do because of blue screen and all the things, the technical aspects of it were, were um, sorted it all out. But, but um, it was, a, it was a, a shame in many ways that we can't, and it's very, and it's sort of typically English, I think, I'm afraid, you know, our weather and our mm. politics are very peculiar at the moment. No, we've got very little time, but I just wanted to mention family. My, my um, mother-in-law is a uh, Kazakh, and one of the reasons we have such a good relationship is I've never had a conversation with her. And um, they, they, they've kind of nailed it, because, because being nomads... They, they have to figure out a way of looking after the, the grandparents. And, and the youngest child, the long, youngest son, wherever you are in the world, has to stay behind and look after the grandparents. And the first granddaughter belongs to the grandparents. It's called okay. the grandparents. So you're, you're a great family man. And just the, the little research I've done, I, I, it does seem to be absolutely essential that you, you get your family priorities in order w without being um, free nannies and help. Yeah. Um, that would be quite interesting. As, uh, for, for you. Um, do, do you think that's that's right? That f family becomes much more important as you as you as you get older, and having that relationship calibrated in the right way is essential. Yes, it's vital. I think, isn't it? Yeah. Families are yeah. absolutely yeah. wonderful. I have a marvelous family, and my wife's just had cancer. Uh, and has beaten it and got it again and then had a problem with her heart and she's here today talking um, um, you know far more intelligently than me and and far more reverently than that I probably do um, but yes my family and my children and everything are all such an enormous part of our lives and and make our lives I think Really well worth living and above, three, above okay. everything. Families and and through your family, you be, you become the, the um, chairman of the International Ch uh, Churchill Society. Oh, so that, that's a large part of your life. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I have been doing that for twenty years, and um, it was a thankless job until about ten years ago, yeah. when um, I met uh, a, an amazing lady called Jenny Churchill, and it's taken me ten years to persuade her. And uh, at my old age, she took me on as a charitable cause and married me last year. <laughs> Congratulations. And, and, um, 
do you, do you, what would Churchill think of this? Because he, he didn't really hit greatness until his mid to late 60s. Would, would he? He had a date with destiny in my yeah. mind. Yeah. Look, I, I, the man was a wonderful man. I've been, I've been privileged to learn a lot about him, but what inspired me to him was very simply, I, when I first started studying him, I bought a house. I was living in the States, bought a house in Westminster, went to find a biography on him, and that started it. And uh, But this man kept... Unlike most politicians today, he kept his ideology, his beliefs. He would open his big mouth, get knocked down for them, get up and do it again and again and again. And frankly, that's an inspiration to me. And uh, I've been knocked down so many times I have calluses on my bum, but I'm going to keep getting up till I die. Good. A great inspiration to me was Churchill saying that... uh Alcohol's, I've taken more from alcohol than alcohol's taken from me. So I think we'll, we need to all have a drink and uh, toast. It's a great, great man. Um, we're so honoured that you, you, you could join us on, on this Monday morning. It's, a, it's the best antidote to Monday morning itis I can think of, apart from sleeping until lunchtime, which is how we used to deal with it <laughs> as undergraduates. But uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, your, your Love Day uh, project is, is, is here represented. And your team are here as well, Julian. Um, sadly, you're, you're, don't you, you don't have a team here um, promoting things. So, but we, we, we'd love to ask, answer some questions if you if you're if you're around afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>